if you wouldn't kill your baby outside of the womb, why would you kill your baby inside the womb? I think that there's like this uh, stigma. I think when you, when anybody, when, when the word Trump is anywhere in somebody's space, there's a lot of crazy conversations that happen, a lot of crazy beliefs. Um, and, and a lot of times we can't separate fact from fiction. Um, I'd be curious to ask you this. When you run into other Black women, I mean, knowing that, I think Kamala Harris, I saw today, uh, or yesterday, thank Black women basically for getting her across uh, across the line in this election. And, uh, and, and a lot of people had different things to say about that. Um, given that you're a Black woman who didn't go with uh, with the masses, uh, what is your what are your conversations like with other Black women? I mean, just the good and the bad. Not women. only am I a Black woman, but I'm a Black woman that's married to a Black man. Not only am I married to a black man, but I have three black sons and I have two black daughters. Shots fired. Shots fired. <laughs> nah, she ain't no shots fired. She just pretty much just let you know what it is and you take it how you want it. She just let you know her love for her people. So when we are talking about black representation, it is time for us to get some black representation that represents us. <laughs> Let me first say that. Once I say that, black women, they understand where I'm coming from because you know, for me, and I get a little passionate sometimes because one of the biggest things for me with Kamala is her stance on abortion and me knowing that she is heavenly funded by Planned Parenthood. Not only is she funded by them, but she She's also a voice for them. It's just disrespect. I, I feel it is disrespectful to have someone constantly push a narrative that is black women like me that, like I said before, come from the hood because we know they target low income women that to say that the best option for us is abortion. Now that my children are grown, they are all blessings. They're the best things that God ever gave to me. All of them are different. I love every last one of them. And it's time for us to begin to teach and preach a different message to young women of color. Instead of every time they're talking about women of color, is women of color need access to abortion. I have to challenge that because I've never heard any of them say white women need access to abortion. We know that abortion ends the life, right, of a child. And if we're talking about us being an oppressed minority, we're always going to be oppressed if we're encouraging abortion and we're, it's like we're killing our own army and we're aborting our own votes. So when it comes to us looking for black women to lead, we need to make sure that we are not only listening, but respecting those black voices that are saying, no, mama and daddy, have this baby, keep this family together, raise this child. But what we have now is people in leadership positions telling us to run to the abortion clinic. Now, I'm sorry you said this is free speech, but I just gotta say that's ass backwards. We ain't getting nowhere with that. You know what I'm saying? And it's just time that we begin to have a conversation. We got to rethink this. We got to begin to promote, you know, pregnancy prevention. Birth control is not abortion. Okay. Birth control prevents the pregnancy. Population control is abortion because abortion kills the baby after the pregnancy. So we Sheesh. <laughs> she is preaching. <laughs> she is preaching. I didn't know she go this hard. I like it. You know, I'm a little aggressive already. I'm already a little aggressive, but I love when it's when it's uh, presented with facts, truth, um, class. You know what I mean? Intelligence. Yeah. We just got to start, you know, not recognizing the difference, telling the truth, understanding that we are hurting our own community through abortion. Abortion is not a blessing for us, and it's not healthcare. It's death care. So that's my biggest issue. When we're talking about having black voices that represent us, get you some black queens in there that, that got black children, that's married to black men, that can be a real voice for the black experience. It's not health care, it's death care. Wow. You know, I I I I am I'm, I'm gonna I have to be biased in, in this conversation. I, I I'm with you on that. You know, I um my mother, uh, when she gave birth to me, my mother was she got pregnant at 16, and my father was 15, and I do not know him at all. I, you know, he died a couple years ago. I didn't know him at all, and so um, you know, my mother, who happens to um, understand exactly where you're coming from, she uh, talks about you know the fact that she that if they'd had a Planned Parenthood 
clinic down the street and somebody had gave maybe gave her some money to go down there or the abortions were free she said there's no way you will be here she yeah said, I, didn't, I didn't know what i was gonna do and uh and and, and it, it mortifies both of us because we think about all the great years we've had together you know and she says you you've done so many amazing things and she says she said something she said god told me that you were going to do some interesting some some heavy things in your life and that i needed to work my way through this and i and i and and, and here's the thing i will say that um, I've never felt compelled to tell somebody what they have the right to do or not, or don't have the right to do. But something about the abortion conversation always bothered me. Like when mm -hmm. I went to sat, when I went to uh, Johannesburg, and, and I'm sure you can speak to this. Um, you know, I saw advertisements for free abortions all throughout the black neighborhoods, everywhere. I mean, on every block, just a thousand of these little little ads. I saw. I didn't see them in the white neighborhoods. And I said they are nope. trying. To you know why? But why is that? Because we we get a, we get abortion clinics and they get fertility clinics. Trust and believe that this is black genocide. If we go all the way back and begin to research the Negro projects and Title X funding, we'll know that this was a diabolical plan put in place to rid right America, the world of an unwanted group of people. Right now, today, back then, that unwanted group of people were blacks. Right now, today, that unwanted group of people, they label them as low income. Wow. Sheesh. It's transferred over. It's not racism anymore. It's classism. So the low income, that's how they cloaking it. That's they covered under that cloak right there. No, we need to still make this happen so that they can get all the abortions we they want. All the abortions. I don't care if the baby is 10 months and was born on the eighth month. You go get them and kill them. Let's eat it. I don't care. The whole purpose is crazy. It is nuts. Is nuts. Well, we know who the low income people are. We know where the poverty neighborhoods are. And we also know where all of the abortion clinics are. And what they've done is they've done an excellent job at tricking us with words because they'll say my body, my choice. Well, Dr. Watkins, I have to ask you, you're very intelligent. Do you and your mother have the same body? See, no me way. and my, none of my children have the same body. It's not your body. It's the baby. Because if it was your body, you would be the one dying during the abortion process. Then they say, oh, well, it's not alive. Wow. It's just a clump of cells. Well, if it's not alive, why do you need an abortion to, click, to kill it? Dead things don't grow. So you're not going to just have something in your belly that's not growing or just in there. If you have to have an abortion to kill it, then that means that you are ending the life. And then a lot of us don't understand lifespan development. You know, you go from being a egg to an embryo to to an to a fetus to an infant to a toddler to a child to a teen to an adult, and throughout that whole lifespan development, you're still the same person. So I tell my women when I talk to them all the time, if you wouldn't kill your baby outside of the womb, why would you kill your baby inside the womb? Oh, sugar honey iced tea. This lady is, uh, <laughs> she's on fire. I need to find a debate between her and somebody on the, uh, on the left. That's, I want to see her like go toe to toe with one of them lawyers or Congress people or something like that. Governors or something like that. She just, this, this lady is, she tough. It's still the she same tough. baby, she the tough. same person throughout the entire process. And so that's the education that resetting, right, of having us begin to value life because they've programmed us to believe, one, that it's not a life. And we could talk science all day, but Dr. Watkins, you know everybody in this world got here the same way. They mama got pregnant. Mm -hmm. You can't get here unless your mama's pregnant. That's the bottom line. So you can talk about when, how far along, or whatever. That's the process that it takes in order for you to get here. So. We we just, when we're asking other people to value our lives, I think that people are looking at us foolishly if we are proud to say that we're, you know, responsible for putting the party in place that wants to fund the execution of black life in the womb. Wow. Well, you know, um, I'll tell you what, um, you know, it's funny, as, as you were speaking, uh, my fiance was walking by and I kind of waved like, come on in, I want you to hear this because, um, because uh, you know, when you talk about that, um, it's 
it's it's interesting when you mentioned that um the difference between yourself and, and a Kamala Harris is that you know you're you're knee deep in the black community you married a black man you have black children and uh and I I would always even ask that question I said I said how does a, how do you go to an HBCU you know met thousands of black men and then you marry this this, this dude you know and my wife said the same exact thing my wife my wife is <laughs> She, she said the same exact thing, bro. <laughs> but she supports uh, Kamala because um, because of uh, how high she was able to rise being a black woman. You know what I mean? And sometimes our support is that basic. It's like you look at them and you say, well, their credentials must be on point if they are where, where they are. You know what I mean? If they are able to achieve that much, they must be a good person. They must be a hard worker. And then they look like me. I mean, I don't like the fact that she was able to go to Howard University in, in, in Chocolate City, one of the blackest cities in the world. <laughs> And, and, I, and then and then people got mad at me. They of course, they, you know, liberals like to they like to label you and attack you, call you names and stuff. So, of course, it becomes like, oh, you're being sexist. Right. And I said, no, no, no. I said, right. if, if Barack Obama, you know, had been married to a white woman, would y'all have really seen him the same? If, if he walked up and said, here's my blonde hair, blue eyed wife, you know, and my little, you know, my little mixed kids. It doesn't mean you hate him, but there's something to be said about committing to the black family. That the family that, right. that that's the, you know that, that it's hard for me like I could not uh, stand in front of black people and say I'm in it with y'all and I'm sitting with a white woman behind me it just does not work it doesn't fit because the, the greatest sacrifice I can make as a man is who I choose to spend my life with so it was very important even when I was single years ago some people have been listening to me since I was like far from being engaged I said if I ever get married. It ain't gonna be no white. It's just not. It's not gonna happen because I'm choosing that now. I'm choosing the black woman, whatever form it takes. So let me ask you about this. Um, so when you, uh, I, one thing that's really been interesting about this interview is you have talked a, a lot about incarceration, which I think is is a very important issue in our community. You've talked a lot about uh, your your feeling on abortion, and I can see the passion coming right out. Uh, would I be? You know, oh, it's okay. Take your time. Uh, so. It, I would ask you this, is there a, um, it, it's interesting to me that Donald Trump really hasn't even come up in the conversation. And I, I, I and so I'd be curious to ask, first of all, is it accurate for me to say that incarceration and abortion are, are like two of your, your major uh, talking points? And then um, two, why hasn't Trump come into the discussion yet? Just out of curiosity. Well, cause you asked to interview me. And so I thought that I would talk about me. And if you brought up Trump, then I would. There's so many times that I get on interviews and they say they want to interview me. And the first question that come out is Trump, Trump, Trump. And I'm like, bruh, let me see if I can try to get you an interview with Trump. Cause I can't answer for Trump. I can only answer for me. But I'm um, one of the- And then she's still a hood. <laughs> I love it. I was like, bruh, I can try to get you a <laughs> She's. <laughs> This is beautiful, man. This this is beautiful. I I, I like this sort of thing, man. This this is lovely. <laughs> the reasons why I support the president is because for worse, I I knew his stance on criminal justice reform. And you know, a lot of people were talking about the Central Park Five, and I looked into that case, and I'm like, you know, I I, I don't want anybody in prison that's um been falsely accused. So of course, I'm glad that those young men are home. I'm glad that they are free, and I'm glad that they have been compensated. And they're like, well, Trump needs to apologize for the Central Park Five. And I'm like, maybe his apology is signing the First Step Act and letting thousands of black and brown people go free. I said, but when is Joe Biden going to apologize for his 94 crime bill? Not only that, when I wow. began to work with. That is great information right there. I didn't know that like over a thousand people were able to go free based off of um, something that Trump did while he was in office. Hmm. I knew I knew about the crime bill. Um, I actually did a um, did a video on the crime bill. Him actually fighting for it and, and arguing his points for it when he was younger. Joe Biden. I was about to say um, Ben Brandon or something like that, but yeah, you know, people all people get a mess. Apologize for his ninety four crime bill. Not only that, when I began to work with the president and his administration. They were so welcoming. They were so open to me. I mean, they just invited me right in. And the things that I said, they didn't overlook them. 
You know, they looked into them, they wrote them down, they found out ways to implement my ideas into their plans and their rollouts. And so because I've been fortunate enough to have firsthand experience with the president, it was hard for me to continue to pay attention to a lot of the media bias that I was hearing. Not only that, I knew that this president was the first president to be pro-life in my lifetime. Now for me, that was major because I know that black life has specifically been targeted through abortion. So when they're talking about black lives matter, black lives matter, how can you say and stand for black life matters if you don't understand that black life begins in the womb? So we are not protecting the unborn. And then there was this radical abortion Message. law that was passed that legalized killing a baby up until the moment of birth. And so they were trying to pass the Born Alive Act, saying that if there was an abortion attempt made on this baby's life and this baby survived, that it is his own person separate from the mother and that the doctor would have to render aid. Every Democrat in office voted against the Born Alive Act. So those were some of the reasons why I stood with this president, why I fought with this president, what he's done for HBCUs, permanently funding HBCUs, what he's done in regards to opportunity zones and these tax breaks for them to rebuild our communities, which we know we need because they've been burnt down right now and, and, and they're destitute and we've lost businesses. And when we lose businesses, people lose jobs. Either way we look at it, people rebuilding our communities benefits us. You know, I get tired of, well, God has blessed me now, but there have been many, many years of me walking over trash and debris and spray painted buildings. I mean, even down there where the John Lewis, you know, mural is at. So there are a lot of things that um, I appreciated about this president. Um, for one, he was willing to listen. I mean, there are a whole team of us that were advocating for people that have been in prison to be free. And every time we went in and talked to this man about someone that was deserving of a second chance, he looked into it and he's not opposed to giving us a second chance. And so that's one of the reasons why I was one of the biggest advocates for him because I knew that when he came to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, that for one, Joe Biden had been in office for 47 years. The only thing we've gotten from them is abortion, welfare, and mass incarceration. He wrote the 94 crime bill, Kamala used it to her advantage. We have hundreds of thousands of black and brown people still incarcerated right now to this day that I'm going to continue to advocate for and fight for. But those are some of the reasons why, you know, I completely support this president, President Trump, and will stand by him. You know, it's, you people just going to have to get mad. But I mean, if he did something and I felt like it was wrong, I'd say it. But at the same time, I've always said that I would never apologize for my favor. If God put me in a position to be connected to a president um, that would be willing to listen to issues coming from a black woman that's representing the community, not only be willing to listen, but be willing to change it. Why not? I can't operate. I love that. I love that. She's not going to be listening to all of y'all talking about, ah, you, you messing with Trump or you, you, you working with Trump. We, we going to go ahead and get you up out of the community. We canceling you. We, we not talking about you. We not voting for you. We not doing all that other stuff that she said, man, please. And plus I still got love for my people. I'm going to use this, this, um, this relationship and y'all need to also, y'all need to stop being so sensitive too. Um, when someone becomes president, they have to play the game. They're not only the president of black or white people or brown people, or any just one group of people. They're president of everyone. And they're not going to do everything that, to your liking. Some of the things that they do are going to be outright disgusting in your book. They will. And whether they apologize for it or not, what's they going to do for you? You want them to stand up in front of the world and point their thumb and apologize? Will you believe it? I mean, if they move forward on something that can that that hurts you, and then they apologize for it. Is, is that enough for you? What we need to do is look at the totality of the person and try to figure out in their whole, in their whole being, um, how much did they do for me? How much did they care for me based off of the other people who were in that position before? Did they do more than the last one, two, three, four, five presidents? 
did they do less than the last one, two, three, four, five presidents for me and people that I care about? And this is for people who, even if you only care for one group of people, look at it from your viewpoint, your vantage point, your periphery, your scope, and answer that question. Yeah, don't don't look at all of the 80 or 80 percent. He did 80 percent more for us than he did and then the other last three. But what about when he did this and said that and then that? Now you're just being ignorant and sensitive and you're not being productive. You're just being a crybaby. And you're not looking for solutions. You're just looking for something else to piss him on about. Creating emotion. You know, I have to get things done. And that's what I did. So, um, so Angela, what, what do you say to those people who, you know, um, I've heard, I've seen people say that they aren't concerned about what Biden did with the crime bill. They say, well, he's changed. He's a different person. Uh, we need to move on. Um, uh, I think people know how I feel about it. Uh, what is your response when, when people almost, it's almost, it's, it's really fascinating to see the love that people have for Biden. And it, it's almost, it's, it's almost a complete contradiction to any concern we might have for the people that are, are still locked up. I mean, they, like, are these, so... these, are, these are human beings. These are black human beings that are still in prison right now from that crime bill. And it's almost like people act like it never happened, like it's gone. Like, you know, uh, what, what do you say to that? Out of sight, out of mind. That's exactly how people act. If it's not here in front of their faces all the time, they're not constantly being reminded of it. They can't see the people behind bars hurting. They can't see them crying at night. They can't see them trying to defend themselves. They can't see them being in one room for 23 hours and released for one hour daily, every day. They can't see it. Then it's out of sight, out of mind. I mean, it hurts my feelings. For one, it, it hurts because, uh, you know, Trump said, I have $500 billion plan for uh, black businesses and for the black community. And Joe Biden said, if you don't vote for me, I ain't black. And black folks had the nerve to choose the one that said, if you don't vote for me, I ain't black. Like they got to prove to these white folks that they black. We know you black. <laughs> we know you black. Can we get something out of this? Because we're never going to be free as long as we have to be dependent on, dependent on the government. And what I've learned to understand, because I'm a psychology major, I'm, I'm, I'm actually getting my degree next week. What I've learned. Someone did say that the, um, the the crime bill was bipartisan and Republicans signed off on it too. Yeah, that's true. But um, Joe Biden actually wrote it. Joe Biden fought for it. It actually used to be named the Joe Biden something bill. His name was actually on it. So that's different. <laughs> that's totally different. Well, the Republicans signed off on it too. And that's like being caught for... So I'm stealing some chips and you'd be like, but, but my brother stole something too. Like, what are you doing? How are you going to snitch on me? I ain't got away. <laughs> learned to understand is that um, confirmation bias is a real thing. And people can see something, right? A certain amount of times and just believe it to be true. Media manipulation is another thing. They'll take one little clip and play it over and over again. And then they'll give you their comments on it. And you'll be believing that that's exactly what I happened without doing your own research. I think our biggest downfall um, for the black community is media manipulation, listening to celebrities that are well off in life, sitting from behind their computers in their mansions on the hill, telling you that you oppressed and you can't make it as a black person, but somehow they done made it. Celebrities, rich celebrities, can I call them out? Oprah, LeBron James, Jay-Z, Diddy, all of these people, they got all these billions in this network, right? Telling you that you oppressed and we can't make it, but somehow they can have a concert and raise money to donate to the Democrats, but they can't have a concert to raise money to rebuild mm -hmm. our communities. I'm tired mm -hmm. of listening to rich celebrities tell me that I'm oppressed. Yep, and so am I. I want to hear what you all have to say about this in the comments below, man. This is good. And if you have yet to hit that subscribe button, please make sure you do so on your way out the door. Once again, guys, I'm Van, and now we are all the LFR family. And I look forward to seeing you on the next video, hopefully inside of the Patreon as well. You all have been amazing, per usual, man. Love y'all.